surprised ever by the widest margin on record. Earth has just experienced the hottest year since records began. This is the worst drought to hit South Africa. The building El Nino phenomenon will change weather from coast to coast. 12,000 square kilometers of coral are in danger of being wiped out. Food sources for many of our people in the other islands goes with it. There are climate change migrants, people who can no longer grow crops on their land. Scientists are highlighting the urgency of cutting greenhouse gas emissions. 2015 is the hottest year ever recorded by mankind. Over 750 deaths have been reported. Powerful Category 5 storm is the strongest ever to hit the South Pacific nation. Data published by US and UK meteorologists say the sharp increase in 2015 can be attributed to human activities, notably the burning of fossil fuels. News Hour in Paris, where world leaders have gathered for the UN climate conference known as COP21. It's now or never to reduce the world's dependence on fossil fuels. Over the next few days, we will decide the fate of this planet. Uh, it's accepted. Breaking news after years of negotiation, a climate deal has finally been reached. The real headline, the real news, is the voluntary aspect of this. Yeah, not legally binding. This is the same old thing. There's no enforcement mechanism. The original goal was to limit emissions so the planet would only warm by two degrees Celsius. Every scientist who has looked at the agreement say, that's not going to happen. The planet will still warm by 3.5 degrees by the end of the century. And that's not nearly enough to stop the very worst impacts of climate change from impacting the planet. More needs to be done. of this climate summit, we see a very clear gap. The, the politicians are not stepping up. We're seeing the people and the movement stepping up to close that gap. There are groups around the world organizing to shut down the fossil fuel industry during May 2016. It's time that we begin to take the issues that impact our climate and our environment seriously. Break Free is a global moment where, for the first time in the movement, we're seeing a very concrete time frame when escalated actions are happening across six continents, targeting major fossil fuel projects with the message that the oil, gas, and coal need to be kept in the ground. It is our future. We must say no. The level of urgency is coming together very clearly worldwide. <laughs> can't wait for the politicians to catch up with that understanding. So people are basically taking things into their own hands and doing what needs to be done on the ground. What is legal is not necessarily just. We cannot simply confine ourselves to what the law offers for us to demand a different world. I remember the time when to even distribute flyers about the issue of oil was against the law. Things remain the way they are because we allow it. The moment we do not allow it, we take away our consent, then change happens very, very rapidly. In 1986, we were able to successfully oust the dictatorship Marcos. It was not just a struggle against repression of our civil and political liberties. It was also a struggle against a dictatorship that had many dirty and harmful energy projects. We create change through empowerment of people because we believe that's the only change that will last. Siguro pagpunta niyo dito sa baybayin, may pagbabago ba sa kalagayan at pag ano ng kabuhayan ng 
natirahan ng mga mamay mamayan na siya daw unang makikinabang sa pagtatayo ng ganitong klase ng enerhiya dahil sa mga ibibigay nitong mga trabaho, kalsada, paaralan, wala ka namang makikita. Ako ngayon ay mag-aalim na po na 50,000 years pa ako nang tutulan natin ng sumula at kuswan. Ay ilang taon na ba ako nakikibaka? Ay ngayon dumami pa. Paano mawawalan ako ng pag-asa? Matitigil pa ba? Ito ay dumami pa. Hindi po tayo nag-iisa. Halos sa buong mundo po, nananawagan na ang mamamayan ng mundo. Naitigil na ang ang pagtatayo ng mga power plant. At sa Mayo, tayo ho ay lalahok sa pangmundong aksyon laban sa coal. We allow our nature to be destroyed by selfishness. And the progress that has been achieved is only for the few. The church has to educate our people to oppose this false progress. Globalization cannot be avoided. What is globalized is materialism, consumerism, lack of care for others. What must be globalized is concern for one another. The whole world is our responsibility. Everything that we do, we are responsible before God to make our world better each day. Most changes in society come from ordinary people who band themselves together and embrace the same vision and really sacrifice for, for the accomplishment of their common purpose. We have to protect every individual and we have to protect our environment. The laws of nature and the laws of economics are in conflict at the moment. Either everything changes because the climate changes and it changes our physical world in ways that we can barely fathom, or we change our economy in fundamental ways. But the idea that there is some middle road where we continue on pretty much as is, that's actually not available to us. Vancouver, like a lot of port cities in the Pacific Northwest, is being eyeballed to be a significant export point for a lot of fossil fuels. Kinder Morgan is, I think, the, the biggest, baddest uh, project on the table right now. It would be expanding a pipeline currently moving 300,000 barrels of tar sands a day to close to 900,000 barrels a day. There's no way to clean up a tar sand spill in this kind of water. They're saying at best they could get, in ideal conditions, 50% cleaned up. If there's one thing about this part of the world, it's that ideal conditions are pretty few and far between. The pipeline itself crosses a lot of very important rivers for people's drinking water, for communities, for the salmon stocks, which are so important to this region all the way as it goes back to Northern Alberta, where we already know the impacts that it's having on the Athabasca River, you know, which has become one of the most polluted waterways in the world and the human health impacts that's having on First Nations communities downstream. Alberta tar sands, the biggest industrial project in the world, with the size of Earth that they want to move is the size of Texas. Kinder Morgan make $13 million a day. And not only do they make that much, but they're subsidized by our Canadian government. We mobilized the community, 100% consensus by Tisleawatu Nation, where we had a referendum and they said, we could negotiate for millions of dollars with Kinder Morgan. That could help some of our people out of poverty. Or we could use our own little resources that we have and fight them. 
100% consensus, we chose to fight it. So right here is, is home. You know, we, we haven't left. This is where we've been for thousands of years. 85% of our diet came from the waters behind us. We've been measuring the quality of water here for about 20 years. It's getting progressively worse. We're devastated, and what we're trying to do is rehabilitate the damage that has caused. We're going to court soon Canada for not consulting us on the Kinder Morgan expansion. One of the ministers said, why, why don't the First Nations take the money? They need it. We don't need it more than our land. We'll do whatever it takes to make sure this doesn't happen in any way possible. We are going to launch a massive flotilla of boats from here and surround the terminal on the other side where tankers fill up, as well as have a group of folks on land march to the gates of the marine terminal so that we block it from both the land and the water. It is, in a lot of ways, a battle between a story of the old and a story of the new. There's a lot of powerful forces trying to make sure that the story of the old continues for as long as it can. We've seen disobedience move from being something that a few people do to a mass movement confronting the fossil fuel industry. A massive oil rig outfitted for Royal Dutch Shell's remote Arctic exploration parked in Seattle's harbor on Thursday. But not everyone is happy about it. They have convinced us progress is only made through exploitation of the Earth. Everyone is coming to protest. We have scientists, ecologists, and city council members who are willing to get arrested because they understand the severity of this moment. Stand up in whatever manner you can. This is our lunch counter to sit on. This is our history to be made. We hold the world in our hands. Thank you. Civil disobedience is a powerful tool in social justice work. The law, it's not sacred. And to challenge it shakes our consciousness. If you can take that radical action in a way that genuinely speaks to everybody else, then you not only have their attention, you have their inspiration, and you build movements that way. Number one, preparation. Calibrate what you are asking for and how you ask for it so that you can win it. Then you've got to choose your strategy. You've got to choose a tactic, a target, that can successfully grab public attention. Then you've got to make sure that your execution is flawless. The media will look for every opportunity to delegitimize you. If there is one misstep, one act of violence, it's over. I've never been in the White House, but the ability to chain myself to the outside of the White House turned out to be important and empowering, and anyone can do it. Most of us don't have huge sums of money. All of us have a body that we can put in the way. I want to say very clearly that civil disobedience is but one tool in the activist toolbox. It's not the first one that you should reach for. And if you use it all the time, like any other tool, it's going to get dull. That said, civil disobedience has a role to play. Nobody should have to go to jail about climate change. In a rational system, that would be the last thing that would happen. But because the way power is distributed in our world, sometimes we have to. One of the central threats to democracy today is the corporate capture of government. We are up against tremendous resources, and those resources are smart. The corporation goes straight to the politician that's going to be on the committee, that's going to pass the law that they want to pass, and threatens their re-election at exactly the right time. 
The strategy of global corporations on climate change was partly to recognize that they had a trump card with the United States government. They could stand in the way of global action by blocking American action. There's a level of state failure in the United States. The legislature is bought and paid for by oil companies and other companies. We have to roll back corporate capture of our governments if we want to try and fix these problems that conflict directly with their industry bottom line. There's nothing radical about anything we're talking about. Radicals work at oil companies. If you are willing to get up in the morning and make your fortune by altering the chemical composition of the atmosphere, and you're willing to do it once scientists have told you what would happen, and once you've seen it happen, once you watch the Arctic start to melt, if you're willing to do that, then you're a radical, and our job is to try and check that radicalism. An investigation is underway into ExxonMobil, the huge oil company buried research about the effects of climate change. Reports suggest more than 30 years ago, Exxon's own scientists were taking climate change projections into account in its operational plans. Exxon was on the cutting edge of science. They wanted to be on the cutting edge of science 40 years ago on climate change. They understood that farther down the road, if the science was accurate, there would be limits placed on emissions from fossil fuels. So their strategy at that time was that we want to have a say in what those limits look like. When their senior scientists told their senior executives what was coming, Exxon started making sure that all its drilling rigs were climate proof so that they could withstand the rising sea level. But they did not tell the rest of us just the opposite. Around 1989, there was a shift in the thinking at the executive level. And that was when Exxon joined this group called the Global Climate Coalition, which sounds very green. But in fact, they were put together to fight any policy reaction to climate change. Exxon and others ended up hiring the veterans of the tobacco industry to try and make the same basic argument that the cigarette guys had made. After three decades of investigation, no causal link between smoking and disease has been established. Scientific evidence remains inconclusive as to whether human activities affect the global climate. It was effective, and it cost us a generation's worth of time. We just recently crossed 400 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. We're literally releasing all of that CO2 that got buried underneath Earth's surface over 100 million years. And we're releasing it over a time frame of 100 years, a million times faster than nature buried it. That is without precedent. It's unclear that living things, including human beings, can adapt to changes that occur that quickly. In the Philippines, at least 6,000 farmers were blocking a highway to demand the government provide rice. The farmers are starving. Behind all this is a rise in global temperatures, causing the whole region to suffer the worst drought in more than 20 years. We've begun to see serious stress on the global food systems. We simply won't be able to grow enough food to feed 10 billion people in a warming world. There's a study that looks at temperatures to come in much of the Middle East. And what they found was the combination of heat and humidity for stretches of time by 2100 would not be compatible with human life. The new study published yesterday finds climate change exacerbated the worst drought ever in modern Syria, aggravating social unrest in the country and helping to push it over the brink into civil war. 
as a record one million refugees and migrants have now crossed into Europe in Europe's worst refugee crisis since the Second World War. In other words, the very real security threat posed by climate change is only going to get worse. You've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. Social movements are different from ordinary politics in that they are not simply about how to divide up the goods, but about what a good is. It enters a domain that goes beyond immediate self-interest into what's required of us as responsible human beings. The secret of civil disobedience is moral clarity. Gandhi said, I am a human being first and a citizen of my country second. He targets the fact that Indians aren't allowed to make their own salt and has a massive salt march across India to the coast where he bends down and picks up sea salt. How could someone possibly prevent you from doing something like that? He's taken the weakest point of his opponent and targeted it to generate the most moral clarity. Different forms of civil disobedience shaped the basis of the abolition movement, the women's suffrage movement, the civil rights movement. It's time for us to say, if you don't do something about it, we will have no alternative but to engage in broader and more drastic forms of civil disobedience in order to bring the attention of the nation to this whole issue in Selma, Alabama. At the core of activism is one simple thing, and that's voice. So many people in the world, their voice is actually just not heard. The Civil Rights Movement had a grounded belief that the first and most important thing to do was allow the people who were on the ground to be able to shape the direction and to be the front of what was happening. It was about building the capacity to organize for action and mobilizing the public to show up in support of an action. The effect of civil disobedience is often to raise the cost of business as usual, to disrupt normal processes and procedures, which makes it more costly to resist change than to agree to it. The African people are realizing that apartheid means nothing else but oppression and exploitation. To change these conditions, the leading black liberation organization, the African National Congress, had begun a mass movement of civil disobedience, defying the laws of racial superiority called apartheid. Civil disobedience brings a spotlight to the violence of oppressive states and industries. The civil disobedience that occurred in South Africa during the apartheid years defied all apartheid laws. But it was really, really strong because it happened everywhere. From street committees, to unions, to labor movements, to student movements, everybody found an aspect of apartheid laws that affected them and then used some kind of mechanism to defy it. It didn't change overnight and it wasn't one day of civil disobedience. It takes time and you will have obstacles, but I really don't think there's any fight that we cannot win if we have the numbers. Biz bu kirliliğe karşı burada Alea bölgesinde yani sanayi bölgesi adı altında yapılan bu fütursuz sanayileşmeye karşı yıllardır bir mücadele içindeyiz.
Yok. Yok. Kapitalizmin hakim olduğu bir süreci yaşadık. Genel evet. onu yaşıyoruz. Şimdi özel şirketler etikleri yapıyorlar kendileri aralarında. Biz karşı çıkmaya çalışsak da e, karşı çıksak da ikinci bir çevre hareketiyle kendileri çevre etki yaparak bu Tesisler yeri yapılırken, daha yeni işletmeye girerken, büyürken falan oraya işçi alınacağını, oradan para kazanılacağını çok evet. kandırıldılar. Var mı? Bunu o her zaman biraz ama geçerli. anladı. Bu 1989'un Mart'ında arkadaşlarımla birlikte belediye başkanı seçildikten sonra Ankara'dan bir e, çevre genel müdürlüğünden bir bayan telefon etti. Dedi ki tanışmıyoruz ama önemli olduğu için size Ali Ağa için bir kara haber vereceğim. Ali Ağa'da bir tel kömüre dayalı bir megawatt ucunda bir termik santral kurulacak. Şili'den Kıdağ'a kadar bütün belediye başkanlarını çağırdık. Türkiye'de vahşi kapitalizmin bir göstergesi olarak Anaya'da başlayacak olan bir saldırı. Termik santral alanına ağaçlarımızı, çocuklarımızla, evrim coşkunlarla, yavrularımızla dikeceğiz. Gücünüz yatıyorsa gelin sandın. Kulakları İzmir Büyükşehir Belediye Başkanı o zaman. Yüksel Çakmu ve bizim 18 belediyemiz yine bir sevgi zinciriyle protesto etti. Aşağı yukarı 60 kilometrelik bir alan da 50 bin kişinin katıldığı bir çevre hareketi. Bunu o gün yaptığımızda belki de Türkiye'de şimdiye kadar yapılmış olan çevre hareketleri içerisinde en çok ilgi gören eylem oldu. Bu sanayi e, burada bizim verdiğimiz mücadele orada sadece bir termik santralı durdurabildik. Ama geniş bir alandaki şeyi e, sanayinin devam etmesine engelleyemedik. Bugün e, Ali Ağa'da bile bir yeni termik santral kurulur vasiyette kurulmaya devam ediyor. Kimse sesi çıkarmıyor. Oradaki insanlar e, ayrı tabisi kovalayacaklardır. Yani e, biz bizim geçim kaynağımızı yok ediyorsunuz. Bunu açıkça söylüyorlar dediler. Bizim benim burada kanser oluyorsunuz, ölüyorsunuz dedik. Tekne olacak dedi ama işimiz yok dedi. Aç, aç, aç. Bu yani biraz insanları da... açlıkla terbiye etme gibi bir şey değil mi? Ya... Ben onları iki otobüse, iki belediye otobüsüne bindirdim. Yatağına götürdüm. Yatağında nasıl etkili, etkilendiklerini anlatan bir köye var. Hatta Birinin burnu tavşan burnu gibiydi. Birisinin kulağı yarımdı falan. Onlar anlattılar yatağın termik santralinden kaynaklanan doğum, sakat doğum oldu. Dönüşte tüm oroz yediği şeyde eylemdi. Bir eylem planımız var. Bu eylem planımıza da Türkiye'deki fosil yakıtı karşıtı bütün yaşam savunucuları, e, uluslararası fosil yakıt karşısında yaşam savunucularını buraya davet ediyoruz. Hep birlikte el ele bu fosil yakıtlardan kaynaklı kötü gidişe bir son vermek istiyoruz. Biz bu 90 ruhunu tekrardan yaşa yaşatacağız. What power means in the context of social change is, of course, the story of David and Goliath. The Philistines send their powerful warrior Goliath to go confront the Israelites, who are afraid. Until finally, David, who is not a warrior but a shepherd, went to King Saul and says, "Let me go fight Goliath." The king says, you're not equipped. You got to take my sword, my shield, my helmet. They're so heavy, he can't move. And he reflects for a moment, he says, wait a second. I'm a shepherd, not a warrior. He takes off all that armor, picks up a few stones, goes to face Goliath. 
It's only when he discovers his own resources, not those of his opponent, as the foundation of his strategy that things begin to shift. And that's what creates those moments of opportunity for the Davids of this world. Lignite has a very low energy density. That means you have to dig up a lot of it to get not that much energy. And in burning it, you emit a whole bunch of other dirt, essentially, which is why this is not just bad for the climate. It's also terrible for people's health. Germany produces and burns more lignite than any other country in the world in absolute terms, including India and China. We look at this now and we see the dirtiest of all the fossil fuels being dug up. And of course, it is the central driver of climate change, which is a central driver of conflict, hunger, destitution, deprivation around the world. This stuff has to be left in the ground. This little town called Poshim produces 100% of its own electricity from renewables and still exports stuff into the grid. Like this village is actually the future we need. Here you have agriculture, biogas, solar power, you have a functioning community. And this is the front line in the struggle against the madness of profit-driven extraction. The government has slated Poshim for destruction because there's coal underneath this. What we're seeing here is the future being eaten by the past. Fossil fuels are the past in more than one way. They are the past of capital, they are the past of energy, they are the past of our relationship to nature. And it... Hello. Genau, wir können auch von ihrem Land runtergehen, wenn sie das stört. Okay, so this was um, Frau Rösch, who was just asking what we're doing on her land. And uh, her, I, I started explaining, blah, blah, we're doing this film. And she's like, are you against lignite? <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay, then you can walk wherever you want. Folks lived here a few years ago. This was their life. The government said, you can't be here because we're gonna dig this up because there's coal underneath. They had grown up here. They were planning to maybe die here. These kinds of images, that's also why we're doing this. The folks here being evicted from their homes because we cannot stop destroying the environment. This cannot go on. All the political work that you're doing when you're mobilizing for a big disobedient action will ultimately be for naught if the action isn't a success in tactical terms. We're telling the situation as it was last year. Here is the open cast mine guards by that. This whole area was our action target. Now, there are always two kinds of obstacles that you need to bear in mind. The first is geographic, or let's call them technical obstacles. Then, second challenge, police and corporate security. Let's call these human or political problems. Our goal is not to fight the police. Our goal is to get around them, because they're not our enemy. Our enemy is the lignite production inside the pit. So when the police start forming a line, with sheer determination, we are walking through the police lines, not hitting them, not engaging them violently, but just walking through them. We ensure that all of the four actions manage to get into the pit. I've been doing civil disobedience actions for 17, 18 years now. It's very hard to get a sense of empowerment, to actually really feel in every fiber in your body that you can make it. We can actually stop this. The moment when we were running towards these diggers and we saw that they were all shut down. I remember this moment of like, oh, we've, we've, we've done it. It was an unbelievable moment of personal and collective empowerment in a struggle that all too often seems brutally hopeless. In May, we're gonna be more people and hopefully they won't be able to stop us. Last year, they couldn't, so let's see if we can do this again. We think we can. If you say you can't 
deal with climate change without a revolution in values, a revolution in the way we think, people will say, well, we, we don't have time for that kind of thing. The truth is what we don't have time for is continuing to try the same thing that hasn't worked for two and a half decades. We continue to be inspired by ordinary people having the courage to stand up against corporate interests, even against government policies that will bring harm to their communities. Hope is belief in the plausibility of the possible as opposed to the necessity of the probable. We don't have the tanks and we don't have the armed forces. Nonviolent civil disobedience is me making my voice heard against a powerful force that is holding us back. Keystone turned out to be a great victory because all over the country and the world, people looked up and saw, you actually can beat big oil. It may seem impossible right now to prevent climate chaos, but social movements have shown that the limits of the possible are there to be moved. My hope is that we come out the other side of this with a global sense of a new kind of power in the climate movement. What we need are new ways to do new things. To practice civil disobedience is necessary to be able to pursue a better life for our people. Batangas now is the center of action against fossil fuel. It's quite possible that a more radical approach will bring rapid change. It's straight math. How many people are active and engaged on this issue? How hard are they pushing? How coordinated are they? It's the people who are engaged that determine what government does. And all we have is a choice to make about whether we're going to be one of those people or not. The science is pretty dark and things are changing very fast. But I am absolutely sure there is going to be one hell of a fight.